Are we all going to fall into a black hole? It's possible. This has been a century for black hole discoveries. There's probably a supermassive black hole that forms in the cores of every single galaxy. We see hundreds of billions of galaxies. That's just what we can see, just as far as our instruments are able to probe. The universe is just full uh, say of that these. Again? That's black holes, millions or trillions, even sometimes the mass of the sun. And they form together with the galaxy. A bunch of Nobel Prizes were awarded for discoveries around black holes. I have a piece coming out soon about Roger Penrose, to Roger Penrose, who, who received the Nobel Prize for uh, his work proving that black holes were an inevitable death state of very massive stars. Before Penrose, people really weren't sure if, if it was even mathematically feasible to form them or if it was just an oddity of a specialized circumstance that nature would never actually attain. Mm. And he proved that it was this sort of generic death state for very heavy stars. And when mm -hmm. we talk about a black hole, because I think, I don't know what most people think of as like, oh, nothing can escape. If right. you get close to it, it's going to suck you up like a vacuum. Right. You know, like that's, <laughs> and we think of that funnel shape, right? right? <laughs> but what does it mean? Mm -hmm. How can you, how can I conceptualize something that is a star, which I'm like, it's twinkling, but I understand there's gas, right? right? In many ways, the black hole is more like a place than it is like an object. Uh, so, so let's go back to the star. The star is also deforming space-time. Right now, we are trapped on a, uh, uh, technically you might say geodesic, more naturally we're inclined to say orbit, mm -hmm. around the sun. And that orbit can be thought of as a groove in space-time created by the presence of the sun, where you can fall freely around the sun and just no engines. We're not firing engines. The Earth is not burning fuel to stay in orbit around the sun. It's for free. Mm -hmm. We are absolutely no engines, no energy. We're just falling towards the sun, but we're going so fast we keep clearing the, the prospect of falling in. And, and just, just right. So the going. so think of a groove on a record, mm -hmm. right? A yeah. piece of dust, a speck mm -hmm. of dust yeah. on that groove will stay in that groove unless something is right. blowing it out of its orbit. Right. It's something just going to keep going. We'll, we'll, yeah. we'll, we could be here for a very, very as we have been very, very long time, and we are literally just falling along a natural curve in space. The curve in space was created by the sun, the presence of the sun. Mm -hmm. That's the Einsteinian way right. of thinking about this. Newton's way would be there's a gravitational force, right. and they seem similar, but there are different predictions from Einstein's theory that, that we can see. We can see the differences. Now, as the sun, if the sun were to collapse to a black hole, which it won't, it's not big enough. Mm -hmm. um, it'll kill us in other ways. But <laughs> if the sun were to collapse to a black hole, uh, our orbit would be absolutely fine. So there's this myth about black holes that they suck everything up. We would find us a perfectly smooth orbit around a black hole at a safe distance. We could orbit forever exactly the same. And so black holes do have circular orbits around them. It's just that you can get much closer to a black hole. So if you look at the sun, it's like a million and a half kilometers across in diameter. If it were a black hole, it would be six kilometers across. So I'm taking the entire mass of the sun and I'm crushing it to the size of a city, okay? And once that's happened, now it's only six kilometers across. I can get really close to that thing without burning up. I could have an orbit 30 kilometers outside a black hole, like right on top of that black hole, and I won't be sucked in. It's a perfectly safe orbit. And the problem is I when don't I, feel comfortable. I would not feel comfortable. It would be but we're using kilometers. That's even your metric system. <laughs> I feel like I'm tightrope walking I on really a very high miles. building edge, and you just one slip and you're sucked in, and that's yeah, it. Yeah, you don't. It, it's not. I mean, you'd it would be apocalyptically cold. <laughs> <laughs> so in that sense, it's not fundamentally different. It's a, it's different by degrees. It's different qualitatively. So the sun has a lot of the kinds of orbits a black hole has, but. But the more interesting orbits are only when it's so small that you're in so close mm. that it gets more and more conspicuously mm. um, relativistic. And you start to see much more unusual phenomena mm. that you can't see because the sun's just too diffuse. It's mm. too big. A million and a half kilometers, all that mass spread out. Got it. It's just more diffuse, you know. And, but if you, if you crush it down to six kilometers, the mass of the sun, then the everything we're describing, the orbits, our curves in space time, the curves just become more and more dramatic, harder and harder to find ways away 
um, requires, if I want to leave this orbit, I can send uh, a satellite traveling with some fuel, and I can send it past Jupiter. We've done these things. If we were very close to that black hole, that would be really hard. It would be energetically cost a lot to get further and further away. So it's really just a matter of the degree becomes dramatic. And eventually there's a region where you would have to travel at the speed of light to escape. And that is just not something we think matter can do. So we've seen black holes uh, often come with stellar companions. Uh, stars can <laughs> stars can come in pairs. One of the stars dies, becomes a black hole, runs out of fuel, becomes a black hole. The other star now has this okay, this you know very dense object in the material. It starts to cannibalize its companion. We start to see black holes destroying their neighboring stars and things like that. Do all all stars starts to ruin the neighborhood? Yeah, <laughs> all stars don't become black holes. No, um, about one percent. Why? Uh, it's about how, happy, how, how massive how they massive are. They are. So our sun, when it runs out of fuel, it'll go through some period of collapse and expansion, but it just, it's, never, it's not heavy enough to overcome how hard it is to crush things, right? It's hard to and, crush things. And how, how um, <laughs> Valerie's asking, <laughs> how do we see this? So it's like a big telescope. So this was, well, this was first observed in x-rays in the 60s and 70s, uh, we saw what looked, they're called X-ray binaries, we, we saw essentially a black hole that looked like it was tearing apart its neighbor. It looks like bright flashes of light in X-rays coming from a tiny, tiny, tiny region. And so you're deducing how much mass in a small space. So one of the things about black holes, we think Got of these huge it. monsters. Point of black holes is they're spatially small. Something's going on here. Yeah. There's an enormous mass. There's light coming off of it, right. and we know that that comes from an expenditure of energy. I'm seeing a tremendous amount of energy coming from a very, very small space right. that seems to have a lot of mass. And that combination is when people began to say, we think these are black holes, <laughs> uh, because they couldn't find anything else that have so much mass in such a small space and be responsible for such energy. The light you're seeing is not coming from the black hole. It's coming from the, the, the destruction of the neighboring star. And so that is how we see. We see black holes powering jets that are larger than the galaxies in which they reside. These are jet, magnetic jets, like literally like ray guns, blasting highly pew, pew. charged particles into these huge jets that can go billions of light years across. So that's a tremendous amount of energy and power originating from a very small source, again, a black hole. And now we, we can look at stars from the center of our galaxy and we see them orbiting something that's four and a half million times the mass of the sun. These supermassives are different than dead stars. We don't know where they come from. Four and a half million times the mass of the sun. And it's very small. I mean, solar system sized. But if you think, I mean, if you think about the mass of the sun, you think it's only four and a half million times the mass of the sun. It's only about 17, 18 times the size of the sun across. So you're jamming in that tiny spatial region four and a half million times the mass. And that's when you get a black hole. So we see this black hole at the center of our Milky Way. It's 26,000 light years away. You can see the stars orbiting it. And you're like, what's that? There's nothing there. I can't see anything. And you say, oh, it must be a black hole. And now more recently, we've literally taken a picture. The project was Event Horizon Telescope. It looks... Uh, very smudgy because it's hard to do. It's only a few pixels. But what we see is we see the ring around the shadow Whoa. cast by the black hole. And the ring is from debris that was hot, that was falling in. Really what was most surreal about it since we anticipated the result was feeling like a billion people um, you know, in that moment were looking together at this nothingness at the center of our galaxy that we orbit, right? And that might have something to do with why there are habitable regions in the galaxy. Philosophically speaking, mm -hmm. what does it mean to you or the average person that there's nothingness at the center of our galaxy? This idea of the nothingness of black holes is, is something I think we're still trying to understand. Objects in the ordinary sense are all slightly imperfect, or if you don't 
I want to say that they're slightly, they're, they're features, distinguishing features. And that's true even with the most finely crafted Swiss watch. It really always has some fundamental distinction, even if it's at the microscopic level that I can't easily detect. Ordinary objects are unique. Black holes are, are indistinguishable from each other in a certain very profound way that we only see at the level of subatomic particles. That has to do with the fact that they're really nothing. They're not made of, it's, they're, they're atomic content's unimportant. Whether there's atoms in the interior or not is unimportant. They, they have this flawlessness hidden behind the event horizon. The event horizon cannot tell us anything about the interior. And in its um, intensity of, of obfuscating the interior, it makes this flawless veneer. And that means black holes look the same if they have the same mass, regardless of what they're made of. Because nothing is nothing. Because <laughs> nothing is nothing, and they're indistinguishable, and the event horizon won't let us know if there's any distinction. If, if, if they were all made out of encyclopedias or all made <laughs> out of some weird element or just made out of light, you can't know this. But they start from a star. They start from a star, but what is made in the end is something. But just like nothing made a star, a star can, can make, make nothing. nothing. <laughs> That's good. This idea that they're similar to gigantic fundamental particles, I think is very profound. I think it says something about black holes' role in the fundamental uh, theory of the laws of physics that is not played by anything else at macroscopic scales. What has happened recently that black holes are being talked about so much? Is it mm -hmm. that there's the picture? What yeah. has evolved? On the end of the 1900s, uh, people were thinking black holes might start to fade in terms of their scientific importance. And um, I remember I was very excited about black holes. I was all about black holes in graduate school. And people were like, what are you doing? You know, come on. We sort of know everything we need to know. But where, where are we going to go with this classical system? And then a lot of things happen. One of them is purely theoretical, and some of that is observational. So yes, we started to see the stars orbiting the center of our galaxy. People watched them patiently for 16, 17, 20 years and, and deduced that there was a supermassive black hole. That was a surprise, because that doesn't come from dead stars. These are new. We don't know where. they're Actually, they're old. They're probably the oldest black holes in the universe, but we don't 100% know where they came from. Probably skipped stars altogether, directly collapsed in, in very diffuse material in the early universe, you know. So these are fascinating. Then there were these other, um, yeah, just other observations like that, beginning to understand these things we see in the farthest reaches we call quasars, most powerful, brightest beacons, most powerful engines in the universe, and they're probably, well, I think very confidently sourced by black holes. And, um, and then these recent things like taking the picture of the black hole. And so, the conversation now is an active one of science. How did they form? What effect do they have in the galaxies? What's the role that they're playing? Will we all end up falling into black holes? So there's all of that astronomy, good old astronomy. The rest of the world might not continue to be as interested in it as we are. <laughs> and then there's this theoretical stuff about black holes being fundamental. That, I think, is a real driver for people who want to understand quantum laws of physics. They want to understand quantum gravity. They want to understand if there truly is a theory of everything. They want to know if string theory is right or wrong. And black holes are your, are your terrain to understand all of that. Are we all going to fall into a black hole? It's possible. So we're in orbit. Or the picture that we just discussed, one of two pictures that have ever been taken of actual black holes, uh, we are in orbit around that black hole, very slow. And eventually, we could fall in. I mean, Slowly drifting into it? No. We're orbiting safely like we are the sun. And the entire solar system is going together. Uh, our whole solar system together orbits the black hole. And when Andromeda crashes through our galaxy, we'll, we've probably, we might have collided before. We'll probably collide more than one time in the future. If we were to fall into the black hole, we'd all go together with this. It's not like it's going to pluck us yeah. separately. I'm sending like you Like a first. piece of lint from the, you know, <laughs> solar neighborhood. But, but, but we're very stable. It's this thing I told you, black holes aren't vacuuming things up at 26,000 light years away. 
you're fine. You, there are things in orbit around the black hole. These stars we talked about, they're fine. He likes things they're to be worried orbit about. Around the what black should hole. he be worried about? <laughs> yeah. What happens when you do get in a black hole? Explain this. So one of the most beautiful uh, results that goes all the way back to when Schwarzschild first found this mathematical description was this idea that time appears to slow as you approach the event horizon. And let me clarify what that really means. If you and an astronaut are in a happy space station together and you are in some safe orbit outside the black hole and you're monitoring it, fine. One of you jumps in. As you approach the black hole, you've beautifully manufactured NASA watches and they're perfectly synced. <laughs> One of you falls into the black hole. As you approach the black hole, your watch will appear to run slowly according to the person who's safely back on the space station. But so will your breath slow down. So will your biological functions. From your point of view, your clock is just fine. Okay, everything's synced just fine. It's the person back on the space station is going really fast <laughs> and seems to be aging really quickly. And their hair is turning gray and their clock is whizzing and music's playing really fast. And all of these things are happening as you approach the event horizon. Now, as you get to the event horizon, your time has slowed as much as it possibly can to the person who's now aged 100 years in the time you've aged, let's say, a minute, however long it's taken you to do this dramatic fall, thinks you've frozen. At one point, they were called frozen stars because they didn't understand what happens when you cross this boundary. And it seems to them that you actually never quite make it across. Now, eventually, your mass will deform the black hole enough and you know maybe after a million years they'll be like oh yeah they're gone but from your point of view it, the whole thing took a minute that's like in contact when jodie foster yes. has like this entire experience and, <laughs> and she <laughs> sees her dad and she meets god and blah 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 and she comes back and <laughs> they literally said you disappeared for 10 seconds it's right. like every near-death experience we've heard <laughs> yeah and well <laughs> to the person going across them that's the interesting person and that was not understood for a very long time, that what happens to them? Are they really frozen there? And relativity suggests that they're seeing nothing unusual. So how are they hanging out there? And actually, as far as they're concerned, we call it no drama. They had an experience as unspectacular as stepping into the shadow of a tree. And they crossed right over. And they didn't know. Nothing terrible happened to them. If the black hole is big enough, they actually don't get torn apart, which might seem counterintuitive. They can drop across just like a pebble. And, um, and then, it, you know, then it unfolds. <laughs> okay, and then they're in trouble. Um, the, they might start to notice things are looking weird. But black holes can be bright on the inside, even if they're dark on the outside, because light can fall in behind them. Nothing's stopping the light from coming in. Think it out. So they can see the space station and going through and falling apart and millions of years passing. And they can see the galaxy evolving, and all these things happening very quickly as they approach the singularity in there, our, our description breaks down terribly. Nobody really knows what happens in there, but you, you, survival is absolutely not. <laughs> um, you know, as I say, you, the, the Black Hole Survival Guide uh, title is a, you know, spoiler alert, it doesn't end well. Yeah, <laughs> does not end well. <laughs>